I'm Ben Goodwin. This is Win the Day with James Whitaker. You're listening to Win the Day with James Whitaker. What we do in life echoes in eternity. Broadcasting from Los Angeles, California. Here's your host, James Whitaker. Let's go. Hey, winners. Welcome back to Win the Day, where we sit down with some of the world's true change makers to give you all the tips, tools, and strategies to win the day every day. The quote for this episode comes from Oscar Wilde and says, I have the simplest taste. I am always satisfied with the best. Joining me in the studio is Ben Goodwin, who I can hear laughing in the background, founder of functional soda brand Olipop. If you've been to my house any time in the last year, my wife and I definitely would have handed you one of these drinks. And the reason that we love them so much is because sparkling water is pretty boring and the heavier soft drinks, they just got so much sugar in them. So what we love about Olipop is it just hits that perfect middle ground and still full of flavor, as we'll get into today. In 2018, Ben, alongside his business partner, David Lester, launched Olipop as the world's world's first clinically validated soda that's good for digestive health. Their brand has taken off and they're well on their way to evolving a soft drink industry that's worth more than $40 billion in the US alone toward not just a new product, but an entirely new category. Raised on the standard American diet, Ben had an epiphany at 14 when he began focusing on exercise and nutrition for the first time losing 50 pounds and developing a love for how the things we put in our bodies contribute to physical and mental health, especially the human microbiome. He's been developing products in the digestive beverage field for more than a decade. He's also dedicated countless hours aligning with academic researchers, medical professionals, dietitians, and other luminaries in the field to make sure Olipop is the best product it can be. Today, Olipop is available in more than 10,000 supermarkets and has an A-list of investors, including the Jonas Brothers, Camilla Cabello, Priyanka Chopra, and Gwyneth Paltrow. It's been heralded, this is my favorite part, it's been heralded as the most disruptive innovation to soft drink since the introduction of Diet Coke in 1981. In this episode, we're going to talk with Ben about how a challenging childhood and how that shaped the man he is today, his best lessons on the entrepreneurial journey, what he's doing to remain one step ahead of the competitors, and how he built Olipop into a disruptive powerhouse. Before we begin, remember that the right bit of inspiration can completely change the trajectory of someone's life. So there's a friend or loved one out there who needs to hear this episode or could use some help to win the day. Share it with them right now. All right, let's win the day with Ben Goodwin. Ben, great to see you, my friend. Thanks for coming on the show. James, thanks for having me. I think you covered it, right? Like, We're done? Was, We're out. I think it's good. It's like, it's all people really need to know. I was joking with you before we, before we got started. Shout out to my wife, Jen. It was very, very important to me to this uh, that this interview went so well. Olipop is her favorite brand. I love Olipop too. We're definitely an Olipop household. What is it about this magic that you've been able to create that seems to just transcend households and have really created that emotional connection with the brand? Yeah, it, well, thank you, A, obviously for having me on, and B, for support. Shout out to Jen. Uh, I, you know, I, at the end of the day, I think, look, there's a bunch of different convergent factors that are all piling together. One, soda has done a fantastic job. I kind of think of it as like, so brands can only, products and brands can only be so powerful, right? Like, you'll only have so deep of an of attachment system to them. One of the things that soda has done so incredibly well is soda has found a way to shove itself into a much deeper attachment system for so many people, right? Mm-hmm. So we talk to customers all the time. I talk to them all the time, and I go like, you know, tell me about your memories of soda, and kind of, and this, there's always the backyard barbecue, like my grandma's porch. That it, so soda is a very, very powerful vehicle because it has attached with people so deeply mm-hmm. in a way that's much more powerful than most brands or products ever could. The problem, as everybody can guess, is that it's not particularly good for you, right? It's like liquid cake in a can. According to the CDC, almost 40% of Americans are diabetic or pre-diabetic. By 2050, the CDC projects that one in three Americans will be will be diabetic. Crazy. We know for a fact that it, a lot of that is the sugar uh, that's driving that and obviously a really inadequate fiber and prebiotics and nutritional diversity – which are all things that contribute to those bodily systems actually working correctly. Yeah. So, uh, and I think a lot of like health products in general, you know, it's they're led by founders who some of them are just chasing a paycheck mm-hmm. and we'll just like move on from that. Mm-hmm. Others of them, you know, are well intentioned, but they kind of rejected the standard 
consumption system or the standard brand or you know like ecosystem and so they're kind of putting their alternative out to the marketplace just but the challenge is just that like most people aren't there right and if you try to create a product that kind of shames people or says like hey remember these deep memories you have with your family like they're all stupid and you're stupid for drinking it you're like okay well <laughs> great job and like see you later because you're not really meeting people where they are yeah. so that's what we try to do with olipop and i think that's actually a foundational part of its success that being said you can't just say you know you can't say that you're trying to replace that uh territory and not really walk the part so the good product you know has branding and flavor profiles that actually to your the point you made in the intro are actually full flavored and actually like meet that real need for many many people and i think that's kind of at the core of the trajectory that we have. Yeah, you know, speaking of full flavored, I've actually got them right in front of us oh, right now. I wanted to bring oh, these sneaky, down halfway sneaky, through the episode. Sneaky. My wife, Jen, packed this pack this bag. Shout out to Jen. I don't know if we've mentioned her that often on the show before. Would you like a strawberry vanilla? Or would you like I see a, a, a little orange sneaky cream? orange cream, which I'm going to go orange cream in this particular moment. Consider it done. We'll yeah, give, thank we'll, you so we'll, much. We'll definitely That's give some great. to Mike as well. So. That's great. How great to have someone just amazing product here on the show in real time. So we're going to let's do a cheers here. Cheers. Cheers to Olipop. Amazing success. Uh, it wasn't all mm, delicious. Delicious. Uh, it wasn't it wasn't all smooth sailing for you in, in your journey. You know, you had a, right. a, a particularly challenging um, childhood. Everyone has a lot of things that they go through. And on this show, we like to keep it pretty real from a mental yeah, health yeah. perspective. What were some of those experiences uh, when you were young that sort of shaped the man you are today? It's it's interesting also the way you phrased it. I was actually thinking about this on the lift ride over. You know, one of those core aspects, I think at my core is it is a really keen interest around innovation, right? And actually, I was thinking about this the other day, like my predilection for innovation kind of saved my life. But that's a like that's a whole other meta narrative arc. But one of the reasons why through that lens I became willing to commit myself to the path of entrepreneurialism is because entrepreneurialism forces you to constantly grow and evolve and adapt. And it does end up becoming like, in my case, the man, but the man or the person that you become ends up becoming like the most direct conduit to your success um, or to your ability to be impactful because you do often, so often have to really reach deep within yourself and figure out who the fuck you actually are. Right. It's, and it's complicated. Um, yeah, my childhood was not great. That's the, that's the headline. I mean, my father died when I was very young. Uh, we grew up really poor. Uh, unfortunately my mom didn't do well with my father's untimely death, which is like not a surprise. Fortunately, she found herself in a very unhealthy relationship with an abusive drug addict. So those are the conditions I kind of grew up under. Mm -hmm. So sometimes like it's it's a semi sanitized version where I'm kind of like, oh yeah, I grew up in a standard American diet and we grew we did grow up poor and like that's all true. Mm -hmm. Also turns out that chronic trauma will drive a lot of you know stress and uh, and cause a lot of negative health outcomes. I mean, arguably as much or more than things you're doing on the physical side. They basically like they work in concert with mm -hmm. each other. The nervous system takes information from how well you're treating your body with your exercise and your food but it also takes information down from the brain and then tells your body how it's doing so that combination did create the state of anxiety and insomnia and the weight gain and all those things in my kind of teenage years uh and it and the i mean i, I don't know i don't i don't know what happened like i empirically <laughs> have a weird brain that is something later in life i did find out like i actually had a 16 channel egg brain scan and I have empirically a weird brain, like the way my, the brain waves that I use to do my primary processing is extremely unusual. It's probably a portion of that that's genetic. There's probably a portion of that that's actually an adaptation to trauma. Mm. I'll never fully know. Mm. Uh, so in this case, it's about like leveraging it so that it actually can help me mm. to the point you made. Yeah, I was literally sitting there one day at 14. Uh, and it was literally, I mean, things about have obviously been building up for a while, this deep feeling of kind of like existential crisis. That all. was that was a feeling that I, I wanted to ask you about. Because yeah. there's, a, there's a quote from Jim Rohn that says, disgust is a powerful motivator. And the biggest turning point for me was when I just, I literally couldn't stand what I saw in the mirror. It happened in my early 20s. It yeah, wasn't at yeah. 14 when, when you had that. And I was wondering, was there an element of that disgust or was it just something completely out of, out of left field that led to the weight loss and started to get around the right people and thinking about what you actually wanted to do from, from life? Yeah, so I, like, 
obviously align and understand the kind of biological principles item of it's like a fact that we move towards pleasure we move, or things that help us survive and move towards things that are destructive and pain and, and i'm like yeah, yeah i'm sure that without the kind of chronic emotional pain you know it would have impacted the motivation level for sure i've also found with my like my gas tank i guess it can run on a handful of different things but my gas tank really runs on inspiration mm. that's when i'm actually like doing it and i think it's and it's also like there's there's like neurological reasons for that right because we have two different and I'm, i know i'm tangenting so if you need me to refocus let me know but basically we, like we've got a, our limbic system and our neocortex in our brain right and they're connected to two different areas of our nervous system so uh and nervous system state so one is your sympathetic nervous systems connect to your limbic system that's your fight or flight uh and then there's your prefrontal cortex which is connected to your parasympathetic nervous system that's your rest and digest uh kind of more complex abstract high functioning open-minded strategic thinking is attached to your neocortex. If you're chronically in fight or flight mode, which actually at this point most of the country is because we've got terrible health and uh, we're having divisive wedge issues shoved in our face all the time, that chronic fight or flight mode, you know, actually makes it very hard to think and calculate and strategize and get to know yourself. So for me, I've never just been able to bank, and I would say even the predominance of what's actually worked for me hasn't not, has hasn't been my, it about miring or rejecting as much as much as it's been about like because the thing that actually flipped me wasn't like holy shit this is hell because mm. my life had always kind of been hell right mm. so what what flipped me was actually a really simple thought was uh, this is not going to create a good life mm. it's just like I and and importantly. I want a good life, <laughs> right? Incredible maturity at the age of at the age of fourteen. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I feel like I had the same epiphany, but it was like nine years later. Sure, and I yeah. mean, and some people do it in the thirties, their forties. I'm really lucky. Mm. I'm incredibly lucky. I was able to do it at that age. You know, it just kind of it is, it is what it is. Apparently, I had to get busy doing something else, so that's <laughs> what I'm like focused on. But yeah, and there is something you mentioned there that I wanted just to to key in on for the win the day community. You mentioned there that inspiration is the big driver for you. Now, yeah. I've often mentioned that number one productivity tip that no one else ever mentions is to be inspired as the hero of your own story. When you know exactly who you are and where you want to go, it doesn't matter how much money is in your pocket or where you're working from or how much sleep you've had. Right. You wake up and you get after it with that inspiration. And I think there are people out there who are drawn more towards in inspiration so much that when the opposite happens, it is just soul destroying. Like it's it's a moral contradiction, and it's very difficult to move out of that place if you're not if you're not in it. It's why I take inspiration. The people I hang around. It's why I do this show. The, yeah. the house is always tidy. It's why I take care of my health and all of these different mm -hmm. things because yeah. to me they're all components of that inspiration that you just mentioned there. Yeah, yeah, and I think like you know the hero narrative archetype structure is super super useful. I think it can like. You gotta be a little careful with it sometimes. Even if you set your topic as like, okay, like, hey, let's stop killing myself here. Let's stop being my worst enemy. I'm let's focus on being the hero, seeing myself in that phenomenal light. Uh, I think that's a phenomenal first step. Yeah. And then the second step is, okay, well, then there's the hero's journey to go on. Yeah. And the potency of the hero's journey is all about going through real challenges that mm -hmm. test you to your core. And that's, again, actually ties itself into the entrepreneurial journey because it's packed with those if you're doing it right. So anticipating those moments are going to be a part of it. Like you don't just get to be the hero and then all of a sudden you don't have to deal with stress and pain. Actually, the thing that crafts you from the conceptual hero into the actual hero is actually 100% the challenges that you are faced with and the soul searching that's a part of that. And then just as a part of that as well, just being like, yeah, I have X and Y's insecurities. These are my weak points. These are my strength points. So I reinforce my weak points. So... Uh, anyway, you probably don't need this pedantic lecture, but it's like that's something I always recommend people combine with the hero's journey is a recognition is that that's what the path looks like. Yeah. And that's also just the maturation process. For sure. Yeah. It's, a, it's recognizing that life is going to absolutely kick you on your ass. You know, if every totally. guest who's come on the show has been so open, a lot of those things that they have that they have gone through. Um, anyone who thinks they're going to be immune from that. We had Dr. Michael Gervais, who's one of the world's, um, best researchers for elite performance work with CEOs and Olympic gold medalists and all these different things. Yeah. He talked about the idea of life is to slide into home base 
with a lot of bumps and bruises and a dirty uniform For and sure. those things rather yeah. than visualizing yourself sliding in completely clean. Yeah, I think it just sets you up for biological reality, right? Mm -hmm. I'm actually reading Anti-Fragile right now, which is a, you know, great book. Like, actually, I one of my staff members was reading it and then texted to me like this sounds like a lot of the shit that you say and i was like oh yeah i've heard of that book i should read it but yeah it's a it's a piece of the equation i mean you know things are disruptive all the time how do you have a sense of self a sense of direction mm -hmm. allow yourself to adaptively respond to challenges and then you grow through that process and construct yeah. somebody interesting you know dr carol dweck she wrote the book mindset talks about the difference between the growth mindset and the fixed mindset yeah and interesting just, i'm not yeah. familiar with her in particular but yeah, yeah. It, it's it's you know it's similar type of thing it's like yeah. recognizing that you have power over your own situation to be able to change things um, yeah what's that way. locus of control yeah is what that's focused yeah. yeah it's a huge yeah it's absolutely it's it's enormous the yeah. the power that that kind of gives mm -hmm. you um you mentioned therapy before. Uh, what were the biggest things that you have taken away from therapy in terms of like, hey, you've been able to practically apply those things for a better life? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so by far, the, so what's interesting is like I'm a big advocate of therapy and we've actually implemented a personal development stipend in Olipop. And one of the things that you can pay for with it is therapy. And actually, it's, it's kind of funny when you say it out loud, but I think like <laughs> about 40% of the Olipop team is like is going to therapy or started therapy the first time i tell that to some people and they're like uh, you know like what are you like are they traumatized working with you and like no like we i hope not uh we're trying to like destigmatize the experience and, and provide access and we create an environment where somebody's like, yeah I, i'm taking tuesday blah blah because i'm going to therapy and, and the rest of the team like high fives them I mean, going to therapy should be like going to a gym for your emotions right it should be it, it, it's like to that for effect. sure it's like i think connection is the biggest thing missing nowadays and you go to therapy you can connect with the therapist you can connect with yourself and it enables you to better connect with those around you especially the team if they're upfront about the vulnerability because you know that everyone's doing that. You just yeah. you bring everyone down to the same or totally. up to the same level. And it also, yeah, it gets away from that like constant uh, kind of American knee jerk of pre pre presenting perfection all the time. Um, yeah. So anyway, I'm a big fan of therapy. That being said, I'm also like a little bit of a hard therapy patient, client, yeah. whatever you want to call it, because usually I'll have done a lot of the thinking that can be addressed uh verbally with a therapist mm -hmm. for so for some folks they haven't they don't have that kind of thought process they need those new lenses and, and that can be like game changing and mm -hmm. it maybe earlier on in my journey mm -hmm. it was the thing that was has been incredibly impactful for me is something called emdr i'm not sure from, have you heard of emdr yeah what is it uh so emdr and i'm, I'm not even going to try to it stands for something which i eye movement reprocessing something 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 but basically, the idea is that uh, we have an easier time accessing subconscious information in what is the brain equivalent of REM sleep, which is why when you have your REM sleep, you have your dreams, your dreams, are your subconscious bubbling up. Uh, so there are a couple different like inputs, so audio, visual, and tactile, and you can actually combine them in different ways. Uh, and it basically stimulates it and trains your brain so that it thinks it's kind of going into a REM state. Mm. What happens... And this is why it was so useful for me. What happens with a lot of traumatic information is you might cognitively understand it all day, but it's really hard to access and process emotionally. Mm. Like I have a, especially earlier in my life, there's a really big disassociation component, right? And I use that to get me through, but I would disassociate, which means I wouldn't actually be able to access it emotionally to process it. The e, with amazing about EMDR is that EMDR actually kind of pulls that wall down. And then in a therapeutic setting, you can actually access it emotionally. And at the end of the day, the wounds are emotional. Mm -hmm. The emotional wounds generate the conceptual narrative structure. But just addressing it on the conceptual narrative level doesn't really hit the core wound. You actually have to get to it on an emotional level. And our brains do this tricky little thing, and they think they're helping us, but our brains are like, that was really intense. Let's split it up into a bunch of areas and make sure you don't access it ever again. <laughs> but it, like, it's constantly this like thorn. It's a defense and, mechanism, isn't it? A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. So that, so I, I, I'm a massive fan of EMDR and yeah. I personally, uh, like combining the audio and the tactile at the same time. I've never actually done the visual, visual version, but that combination I find entrains me really well. Then I can go through the ther therapeutic process. Uh, I've had, you know, 
hour and a half sessions that were more potent than anything I could have gone to in five years back to back talk therapy. Wow. So combining modalities, I think is what's really useful. Yeah. We had a Navy SEAL, William Branham, 26 year Navy SEAL. And he said the hardest thing out of his entire career was asking for help when he felt that he needed it. So totally. I yeah. think it's, so, you know, the stuff that you've shared there, thank you so much, my friend, just talking about like, as you said, to destigmatize this, like for anyone out there who's struggling with mental health, don't go through that alone. That is not strength. That is the complete opposite. Being brave enough to share those thoughts and introduce, you know, welcome someone in to share that with you and get help is a, is a big thing. Uh, ben, something you do that I, I love is uh, you focus so much more on learning how to think mm -hmm. rather than what not to think, uh, rather than uh, than what to think. Yeah. How, how can someone watching this episode or listening to this episode understand and, and implement that uh, mentality of learning how to think? Yeah. I think especially for parents. So good research. I mean, that's the, because that's the, basically the rationale, because I'm a college dropout, right? And that's actually kind of the <laughs> rationale I gave behind it. First of all, with the, you know, the background of not having a lot of cash, like, for example, my sister is a doctor. She got a PhD from Stanford. I'm probably, love you, Megan, but I'm probably the one that's going to end up paying off her student <laughs> loan debts, right? Because that's how the system is built. If you don't, you know, unless you're hyper exceptional, you know, you don't come from the right family, then they yeah. make you a wage slave some other way. Um, but yeah, like I think, um, yeah, you, being able to use your mind dynamically and kind of constantly peeking at things from different angles right is that's what's i think again it's like innovative thinking and not getting stuck into a given trap i think there's a lot of people who and you know i think education is fantastic so i'm not anti-education by any means but i do think that there's a lot of people who become so attached to the piece of paper or the blah 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 and all of a sudden that means blah 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 blah, blah. i actually find it really empowering the idea that like i uh can wake up and like use my brain and be very very interested in things and like take more holistic pictures there's like a there's an empowerment component to that uh that being said like if that's more of the route you take in addition to kind of dynamic thinking you also need a really robust bullshit filter right mm -hmm. because if you're going to open yourself up to a much broader stream of information and try different uh tactics and perspectives on things you've also got to be able to like sniff out your own bullshit you've mm. got to be able to sniff out external bullshit i'm actually like really really skeptical even of myself mm. and that is a helpful counter to trying to be very open-minded and mm. kind of dynamic in my thinking approach but yeah because the brain is one of the most deceptive things that you know around like, yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah that's when yeah. reverting to habits and doing those different things so you still get these things done rather than your brain trying to trying to trick you you know so there was a, a joke on seinfeld where he talks about like the nighttime brain before you go to sleep it's like stay awake as long as you can and then when you wake up the next morning the morning brain is like come on can you please just yeah. go to bed early tonight but it never it never happened i suffer from that very much yeah, <laughs> yeah, i'm like the worst yeah. i get down on myself all the time because like come on ben you're the ceo like get up at five and meditate in the woods for 45 minutes and like i am such a night owl like every single yeah. night my brain's like yeah it's 1130 like time to start thinking about black holes and i'm just like okay that sounds great i like never learned the fucking lesson so yeah yeah i do my sure. best but i am chronically tired for sure <laughs> uh take us into the origins of uh olipop and how it all came together yeah so i mean it is kind of like a there's a consistent narrative arc basically from that moment at, at 14 i think you know what i was expecting out of that process was like yes i obviously wanted a life overhaul and um you know i became super fascinated by nutrition you know, at minimum, because it helped me step into a little bit of a self-empowering paradigm of like, here's all these things I can do. Because I got a job at like 14, right? So I could actually pay for the food I was eating and blah, blah, blah. Um, so I, I like the self-empowerment aspect of it. But I also liked that, you know, if you really invest in good nutrition, like you can viscerally feel the difference. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously that also corresponded with weight loss and energy increase and all those other things. However, the real kind of uh, impact moment, I would actually say came like four to six years later after I had kind of started that journey where cumulatively I was noting that uh, it was not just affecting my energy level, but it was really affecting my cognitive functioning, my clarity of thinking and my emotional stability, which was hard for me to still kind of hard for me to come by, to be honest. So like sort of mood, moods and mood yeah, that type of thing. Yeah, yeah, all that kind of stuff. Anxiety and some, the, all of those different pieces, but also mm. just like for the first time in my life, I was starting to feel like a little bit of like, huh, maybe I'm all right. Like maybe I feel and that was all kind of cum and of course, there's all these different facets to it. 
uh, I got some like really introductory level, let's not break the high schoolers brain therapy in high school. And there's some exercise, but I could definitely trace a lot of it to how I was changing what I was eating. So that was the piece that I was like, wow, this is very powerful. This is something very tangibly that I can do that doesn't just affect my energy, which is important, but also affects clarity and emotional stability and all those types of things. Um, and as a byproduct, I saw it as something that would be very powerful from a self-actualization, mm. personal development lens. Um, then I went through the thing where I dropped out of college. It's a long story, but I was throwing raves and warehouse parties. <laughs> through that, I ended up uh, meeting this guy who was my mentor, he was a civil rights activist, won a Supreme Court case by himself. That really kind of was mind opening for me. After spending some time there, that's when I kind of had this like shift around like uh, how to think versus what to think. Dropped out of college. I was like, all right, what do I do now? Well, I'm really into this health food thing. I think it's really important for the world. Um, and I actually helped a friend start. A friend had basically started a kombucha company. And I was like, okay, I don't even know what kombucha is. But I am really actually interested in beverage for some arbitrary reason. I'll, I want to join and help out. And so I got a lot of really great kind of introductory level experience through that. But I also, in kind of researching what the hell is kombucha, and like what am I doing when I'm fermenting this thing and why is it important <laughs> I learned about the microbiome mm -hmm. and the microbiome is incredibly powerful it's really really leveraged it affects so many different systems of the body the one that stood out to me the most though is something called the brain gut axis right so we, actually 80% of our serotonin in our bodies in our dige digestive tract we actually uh, all those microorganisms produce something called metabolites those metabolites can then be repurposed uh, into hormones and into peptides and into neurotransmitters and so, and then, and then I started looking at the research. It's actually like very, very compelling animal and human research that there's a very direct link between kind of emotional stability and the ability to stay out of fight or flight when people have more well-regulated kind of healthy, robust microbiomes. Then I was just like, okay, fuck, well, this is the thing, right? <laughs> like not only does it help with this kind of brain, you know, this brain and emotional functioning, it also assists with immunomodulation, healthy functioning immune system, digestion, absorption of nutrients. Like it's very, very powerful. So that's that's the thing I ended up deciding I wanted to to uh, to focus on, and then left that after a couple of years. Did some freelance product development, learned a lot more there. Eventually got bored, kind of selling esoteric high end products to people who didn't need more esoteric high end <laughs> products. Which, as a guy living in California who was pretty like new agey myself at that point, like that's just what I fell into. And I was like, I don't know, I'm not really doing enough with this. It's kind of stupid. I'm making fine money, but it's whatever. Uh, so then I wanted to get back into beverage. I started working on something that we eventually called Obi. Spent about four years doing the R&D for that. Hundreds of different uh, experiments with a microbiologist and organic chemist. That's where I started to get more serious about the science. You so know, you were pretty hands-on at that point. In very hands-on. Formulation. And yeah. You have always been very hands-on with the formulation side. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the things I discovered super early is that I definitely have a knack for it. Mm. I also now know that I'm like a super taster and a super hearer and all, all my senses <laughs> are like turned up to 11, which is a blessing and a curse. Um, that's what that Oscar <laughs> Wilde quote made me chuckle. I thought you'd like it's that really one. true. Yeah, I'm like, I, I'm one of those personalities with the shit I don't like. I fucking really don't like it, but I'm not a blanket curmudgeon. The stuff I really like, I, I can really appreciate and I really enjoy. So yeah. um so yeah, so we did that for a bunch of years, and then during that process, you know, we were basically trying to figure out how to how to uh, mutate our own water kefir culture bank and scale it, which is a really complicated process, which I won't brain numb you with. Uh, but then during that pro during that uh, near the end of it, I was like, why don't I just make this into a soda? Because everybody seems to really fucking love soda, and it seems to be causing a lot of harm. And what if I could take all the health benefits that are associated with this product and make it taste like a soda? Well, that turned out to be no simple task. But year and a half later of just like grinding out long, long hours in the lab, making my own custom sweetener solution, like I felt like I got to a good place. And near the end of that, I actually met David Lester, who's my business partner. Uh, we're we're really fire and ice, like we're very different personalities, but we also complement. We have a lot of very overlapping values, which is kind of the core relationships and uh, very complementary skill sets. So we clicked, got some branding raise some cash, launch that. That's a bit of a long story that I'm also <laughs> legally have some constrictions around what I can say, but I'll just go to the end, which is we exited that in 2016 and felt good a lot about a lot of parts of it. Um, had a really good relationship with our investors, had a great relationship with our supplier community, you know, like, and learned a ton and also got really key insights around like going into the, let's make a healthy soda. You know, we literally had board members who, quit 
because they were like, God has given you a gift and you are throwing it away <laughs> by making this a soda. And we were like, no, we want to make a soda. <laughs> you know, I'm like, I felt very confident about my idea. Like, Don't let the door hit you on the ass on the way out. Yeah, more or less, you know, respectfully. Uh, but but a little bit of the back of our minds were like, well, we should probably test that if actually this does yeah. work. And we got some really good data signals during that process. That broadly speaking, that conceptual that concept has legs and potential. Um, yeah, and then on the other side of it, I was like, you know, a couple arm in a sling, black eye, you know, just kind of degassing from that, just that whole, you know, be beverage businesses are incredibly intense under the best of conditions. Because they're going up against Coca-Cola oh. and Pepsi. I mean, these are some of the most, well, if not the most iconic brands in yeah. the history of the world. Yeah, I, I mean, so <laughs> the stat, which I did <laughs> not know getting into beverage, I know now that I'm arguably successful in quotes, but the... Uh, <laughs> 2% of beverage brands make it to a million dollars in revenue, and then 2% of those make it past 10. So it's a Death Star shot. Yeah. Uh, you know, because uh, it must have been tried. Like the, a healthy soda, it sounds so simple, mm -hmm. but there must have been a lot of, you know, a lot of people who have tried it in many different ways that have just been destroyed along the way. Kind of. Yeah. Kind of. I haven't really, like, I'd seen some, you know, there were some kombuchas that were kind of going in the soda territory. There were some sodas that were. I guess I could call them like more health neutral as in they weren't as harmful mm. or like a big, the big innovation is like cane sugar instead of high fructose corn syrup. Mm. So either like slightly less bad, which that's really not that much less bad or more neutral. Yeah. I hadn't really seen many, if any actually like health forward Interesting. sodas. Yeah. Well, it was either that or just, you know, like your LaCroix and your, your basic sort of spark. Yeah. I mean, my kind of best estimate at this point is probably, you know, sparkling water is like a $4 billion category. And I would be willing to bet that half the people in sparkling water are actually just people trying to get away from soda. Yeah. And it's kind of unsustainable because a lot of the people away who I talk to who consume sparkling water to get away from soda. Yeah don't really like the way sparkling water tastes and it's really hard to retain a healthy habit if you very much less enjoy it compared to the thing that you were trying to get away from so are you, are you trying to pull soda drinkers or are you trying to pull sparkling water drinkers what's the priority or is it both the priority at the end of the day is the soda drinker yeah. right it's that it's because it's the biggest bucket it's where the most kind of harm mitigation opportunity lies mm -hmm. However, like everything else, you've got to earn your stripes. Like you've got to earn your way there. So that's why we started in the natural channel, which is typically a more uh, early adopter consumer, a little bit less of a price sensitive consumer because you need to build your brand up, build your revenue base. Then you have the data if you're successful to validate the next level of customer. Then you get that data and then it's the next level of customer. Because again, we're going up against something, which I said on the outset, is an incredibly deep emotional, uh, you know, uh, latch point for a lot of people and one story and this is uh i hope it's okay to sh i think it's okay to show this because i'm not going to say any identifying information but we had a customer uh i think this like demonstrates it really well we had a customer write into us and this is like a tearjerker so prepare yourself but we had a customer <laughs> write into us uh and her uh her grandmother was dying of terminal stomach cancer and in hospice and couldn't really eat or drink anything because stomach cancer is very painful uh and when her grandma was a little girl, she drank root beer all the time. And it was this very nostalgic thing for her. And we hear this a lot from customers who do have health challenges that are going through. This is not medical information, but we just anecdotally get this that, you know, people who used to love to drink soda, but then because of whatever's going on for them, they just can't. It makes them feel too bad. Can actually drink Olipops and they feel fine or great or whatever. And so uh, this woman was bringing her grandmother Olipop root beers because she found that not only could she drink them and keep it down and was actually fine, but uh, it was triggering that nostalgia for her. She wrote into us that's like the only time I saw my grandmother smile the last couple months she was alive was when she was drinking your root beer and reminiscing on being a little girl drinking root beer and then she passed away and now we all drink Olipop root beer to remember her by. Oh, bro, I mean, don't take that flavor off the. Off no, the shelf. Why, yeah. well, you know, obviously I sat there and cried for like 30 straight minutes because that <laughs> yeah. is, I mean, just yeah. the layers to that, like for sure. what it meant to the granddaughter, what it meant to a person who was exiting this world, like mm. 
just all the layers to it. You know, it's 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 uh, it's a yeah, it's a lot. But um, and you're still so new to this journey as well. Like map this out, sort of 10, 20 years from there. Like the the positive impact that can that can have. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like I, I haven't I haven't had a soft drink in at least five years, and I haven't been a regular soft drink drinker in maybe twelve years. And um, my what purely because I'm like I don't want to drink the sugar and all the crap. For sure, you know, yeah, yeah. There's a lot worse stuff than the sugar in there. And I see people who they start their day with these giant can, you know, these mother energy, all these different I know. things. Yeah. I'm like, this is how you start your day. Yeah, it must be crazy. And then to to be able to go and at the end of the day when we're having dinner with we got two kids, um, we sit there and we 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 have a you know we have an olipop and we um we give our daughter it's just a habit we we give her like a little bit of a tonic we call it so she loves just having a little splash of yeah. that as well and it's just such a beautiful ritual to have in the house is a different change from just sort of having having water or nothing at all. It's just nice moments yeah. created authentically rather than, you know, I wouldn't want to introduce soft drink or any of those things to um to our family. So. Well, that's the thing. I mean, again, this is where like having that my own, and this is something that I experienced into my own journey and that own like uh, uh, emotional self reckoning, re- reckoning is you get to the point where you recognize that like we're all just emotional creatures, yeah. right? So, um, and so what's the emotional motivation for people who to even be healthy? Well, okay, you want to be healthy so you can enjoy your life more. So what if we made the process of getting to being healthier, like intrinsically enjoyable? Okay, well, that would probably be, you know, that probably like line up the emotional need sets. So, yeah, yeah. for sure. But I think the, the, the just a quick, just to cap it off, the, the story that, you know, the powerful story about the grandmother also just, again, goes to show how deep that relationship is. Yeah. And so... Well, some people come in and think like, oh, these people are, you know, like have a, some, a problem with, vote, you know, because they're drinking all this, all this soda. Um, I almost approach it with almost like a bit of reverence, like, which may be a slightly heavy handed way to say it. But I'm just like, it's actually almost an honor that somebody would have such a deep relationship with something mm. and then in theory be open to switching to something that allows them to keep that lineage alive would make a healthier choice for themselves and their family like actually it's kind of a big deal you know Huge. so that's Huge. yeah that's more of the angle we try to approach it from we went to uh go and see top gun 2 the other day first movie again having young kids very hard to get out of the, yeah, out of the house right, right. Some time for yourself so my wife and i snuck off and i was like the thing that i just i love about the movies i used to love so much is getting a big popcorn and a big frozen coke and then i was like do i you know does my body and mind really need 100 grams of sugar sure. right now yeah, yeah. i'm going to feel like legitimately hung over like a sugar hangover the yeah. next day I brought it an Olipop, game changer, you know, so simple, something like that to smuggle into the movies. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> uh, what, what was the moment for you from a business perspective where you were like, wow, we're onto a winner here? So I have this weird, like, <laughs> I uh, I do this thing called the Hogan test, which is a whole long conversation, but uh, there's a sub score and it called accomplishment and my accomplishment score is very low. Mm-hmm. Well, it basically means is that like, even if I do something really hard and then I win, and this isn't like necessarily positive, because it's actually really important to celebrate wins. Mm. But I'm all, I'm always, I had this psychology where I'm like, all right, cool, we did that thing. Like, when I view where we are now, like, I'm definitely very grateful, right? Because, to the, you know, given the Death Star shot that it is, it's like way more often than not, it does, it very much does not go this way. Mm. Simultaneously, when I think about the mission and like the goal set that we're after, this is actually the amount of momentum you need to make that even a possibility. So that's like, that's the target I look at. And so this actually tracks alongside that target. Um, We've been really fortunate that since very early on in this company's life cycle, it's shown a lot of signals of demonstrable success, you know, like in, in beverage, Surprise, surprise. The big thing that everybody's tracking is what's your velocity. So what's your sale sales rate rate of the can on the shelf? And ours have always been astronomical, right? And you need that data to prove out to retailers and stuff that you're worth bringing on. I would say we did just have a pretty big moment, which we did just launch to 4,000 Walmarts. Um, and that was a relationship we've been cultivating a little bit. They actually wanted us to come on earlier. And, and if you go into Walmart too early, it's actually can be quite... Uh, harmful for your business so we held off for a while but getting to the point where we're like actually i think it's still a test like fingers crossed you know sweating bullets but i think we're actually ready to like check this out now another thing that i actually came about recently is you know we did a lot of uh, segmentation research and we we've been trying to figure out like 
who are our customers and who's drinking soda and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and tracking our current customer patterns, you know, we're actually over indexing in the Midwest, which most health and wellness products over index in terms uh, on the coast, right? Mm -hmm. LA, New York, blah, 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 which is nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. But if you're trying to disrupt soda and you're trying to create something that actually locks in on a mainstream level, you want to hit the Midwest. Plus, if you're trying to, you know, at some point actually d make a dent in the South, which the average sugar consumption rate is like something like 200 grams a day per person in the South. Um, if you want to have any shot of actually making a dent there, you would need to uh, prove that you can actually uh, execute in the Midwest. Mm. So the fact that we're doing really, really, really well in the Midwest and, you know, the Kroger's and the Target's and the Walmart's, um, that's a great, like, that's very, that's something where I stand back for a second and go like, okay, we're actually like on track here. This is good. Our, our local Whole Foods, and anyone who's watching this, you don't know what Olipop is. Every time we go to Whole Foods to do our grocery shopping, it's like Olipop can't get enough shelf space. I know, we're every, always every stock, time, yeah. Every week, it's like just a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Like, it's it's just doing so well. I look at like the the sparkling water aisle and it just seems so boring and stale. And um, I just feel like these things are going to, you know, are going to start to expand on that. Um, what, what was sort of the, the, were there any guerrilla marketing things or influencer marketing or anything that you did early on to uh, establish that traction that's now got you into target Walmart, whole foods and all of these different things that you're in now? Yeah. I mean, I think there's, uh, there's always, let me think. I really, the thing that, there's never going to be something that like makes up for if your product has intrinsic traction or not, which is like kind of, it sounds, you know, it's like simple and you're like, well, yeah, you just have to have a white hot product. And then I guess everything else goes well. Unfortunately, that is the just solid truth. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I think um, the big, I don't know that like there's a specific like executional tactic, like, Hey, when we did, I mean, this cool stuff that we've done, like really early in the company history, we did a takeover of grand central market in downtown LA mm -hmm. Which was cool from a visibility standpoint. We were a really young brand at that point in time. The more import, important piece of that was actually the belief it built inside of our ecosystem. Actually being able to bring our team together to have that experience. And like many of our different investors for them to come down and even some buyers for them to kind of see the realized, uh, this external, you know, kind of realized version of this Olipop like enclave. And that's always also been my focus, right? So we don't lean over heavily into promotion. We don't lean over heavily into trade uh, trade spend. We have marketing, which is going through a really interesting overhaul with the marketing now, which I can't share too much about. So there's definitely tactics and strategies we use. The thing that's infinitely more important to me is, A, are we tracking feedback from our customers? Are we listening to them? We're making sure that we're giving them what they actually want. Do we have that relationship? And then B, what's the psychology of the people in our team who are out selling this product and, and dealing with people, right? Like in beverage, you've got a sales team. There's a lot of different layers to it. One of the more introductory layers is the ASM or the area sales manager. And there's so many different ways you an ASM can operate. A lot of buyers give us the feedback like, oh, we've got these ASMs and they come to the store all the time. And they're just like, what can you do for me? And they're just like shoving themselves. And that's kind of like, and that a lot of teams are trained up like that mm -hmm. to just be really aggressive. Well, it turns out that's a stupid fucking strategy. Like, to build a relationship. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So we, you know, our ASMs, I'm like, yeah, feel, go in there. Like, if, if take a day off during the week, go back into the store on like a Saturday, help that buyer throw a load. Don't ask for anything. And if you do that enough, now all of a sudden it's like getting your shelf space expanded or doing whatever. Like, that actually is a very, very easy thing that came up as a symptom of the relationship that you built. It's these, you know, uh, that, that kind of training has always been much more important to us than the, like the marketing gimmick or the tactic. Yeah. Um, uh there's always a human behind every decision. You know, the book, Catch Me If they talk about all yeah. the fraud. It's like 95% yeah. of fraud is based on human error. Maybe it's 99, but it's like, it's a lot. And just as in relationships, at any 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 result that you want, all roads lead to a human. You just need to find 100%. the right human and manage the relationship and yeah. get that done. Yeah, I 100% agree. Yeah, you're not really like... And it's even that way when you look at the construction of a successful business that has a product, right? Like, there is no uh, fudging the product market fit. So mm -hmm. that has to happen. If that's there, then it's about actually building a business so do you have margins do you have scalability and then it's about the team and the culture mm -hmm. and it's like and at, and at the end of the day especially as other things kind of shift that becomes where you end up putting 
the majority probably even of your effort if you're it smart uh because that you know the psychology that the team has the cohesion that the team has does the team understand the mission are they aligned for the mission is it is it putting some energy in their in their step every day like are all those things really really aligned and a highly cohesive high trust organization is a strategic advantage mm. it's a it's a meaningful strategic advantage mm. why doesn't coca-cola just allocate every resource they have to just destroying you you know they obviously well, have like a near infinite obviously yeah. they're doing very well with with the lane that they're in but why don't these big big companies and do you worry about that i don't i mean i i try to calculate to the best of my ability for as many probabilities as i can uh one layer is you know i'm sure uh it's a likely scenario that a number of these di different businesses are very much interested in actually acquiring Olipop at some point. So I'm sure they've got to run a careful game around like, okay, do we put something out? Do we incubate it? Do we crush them? Do we buy them? You know, I'm sure they're just doing their own calculus. So the acquisition dollars could be smarter than the R and D and all those things to try and make their own. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I'm no expert in super large scale corporate because i would actually self-immolate in that environment like it's just like obviously <laughs> not my zone but my perception is like especially with these kind of bigger public companies like look they're managing quarter to quarter uh there's a lot of political machinations i think steeped into their cultures i think that generates less uh innovative thinking i think that generates less uh speed and efficacy um and uh that's why they have taken this kind of strategy of buying interesting brands then the hope becomes okay if they buy your brand they don't kill it with mm -hmm. their you know so that's actually even something we think about with olipop like if we're going to in theory go through a uh, strategic exit at some point like how do we actually build this thing now mm -hmm. so that if that happens the acquirer doesn't accidentally dismantle the things that are of core importance to the business in their attempt to integrate it into their business. It's why I think something with Coca-Cola, the brand name could work against them. It's because if I'm looking at a so-called health conscious product sure. and I yeah. see Coca-Cola on it, I'll be like, Man, unless I'm a very loyal customer for a very long time. Yeah. Especially when you see these things, even in, in my wife and I have noticed, even in products like chicken stock, these companies get bought and all of a sudden they start adding this crap in there. It's I like, know. Why yeah. not just leave it the, the way it is that made it successful and, and, and continue so with it? So I could squeeze out another penny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, I mean, it seems no, so crazy, isn't it? I know. Like, yeah. And that's, and look, there's, there's a bunch of things that, that you can do. I mean, that's why you actually, <clears throat> you know, a lot of these CPG brands historically, you know, over the last 10, 20 years that have sold into strategics. They've had a certain, it's almost like flipping a house mm -hmm. where, so one of the common strategies that I see that I can't stand is the business actually gets built like pretty unsustainably. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, oh, we're getting close to exit. And they're like, all right, well, let's just fire all the 1099s and let's like massage this and drive trade spend down. So now the PL looks fine. Mm -hmm. But the that better looking PL is not what build the, built the business that is actually the thing that the strategic is looking at. Mm -hmm then it goes into the strategic, they're never going to run their business in that other way. And, the, and then you've got all sorts of the problems. Like the more of those uh, friction points you throw in intentionally or unintentionally during the exit uh, evaluate, during kind of the whole exit process, the more, uh, the higher the likelihood that it's not actually going to go super well inside of that other business mm. and they're going to have to start making a bunch of changes. Mm. If we actually have something that's like, uh, has actually gone through a lot of really legitimate scientific research uh that research is actually part of the foundation of the brand uh we've managed to put our sourcing together in a way where the margins actually work and we actually have a profitable business uh and it's built for the kind of co-packing and and supply chain needs that these bigger companies will have okay well then we maybe like have something they don't have to tear down to, to its frame and rebuild in a way that's not so great uh, you've done a great job of getting some really high-profile investors on board. How did you go about getting that, and, and how validating is it to to have that people, like group of people, on your side? Yeah, so I am the like least pop culture dude, like <laughs> of all time. Like I, uh, I'm not on TikTok. I only started an Instagram account because I needed to do Instagram lives <laughs> occasionally. I'm on LinkedIn, like uh, you know, kind of begrudgingly because it's useful, uh, but it's not my jam. Like I listen to electronic music. I don't know half these people are. 
I don't even own a TV kind of thing. <laughs> so <laughs> I didn't do anything really. Like I, I will get on, you know, uh, I'll go have meetings with the celebrities and I'll get on zooms with them and I'll talk through what we're doing. Uh, and it's cool. I mean, you know, uh, and I, and I'm also appreciative. Like we're appreciative that, you know, especially the ones that want to lean in and, and, and amplify the brand. Like I certainly appreciate it. I understand their time is valuable and their interest is, is rarefied. That being said, we didn't really go down and we didn't really track down uh, or or knock on a bunch of doors to get the celebrities in that have come in in the brand. Um, they are actually by by large organic Olipop uh, fans, yeah. and they'll find out that there's a round open, and their people will get a hold of our people and be like X, Y, and Z is interested. And there's also a bunch that we've looked at we just haven't moved forward with because the deal mechanics weren't right, or they actually wanted to invest more than we even could have space for, and we're like, this is just a lot to deal with all this. But um, It's like what happened with Vital Proteins, Jennifer Aniston. She was, we had um, Kurt, the founder, on here, and he said, Jen just happened to be a fan. And yeah. then um, it led to everything else organically, which has got to be the best way to which do Which is it. what you want. Yeah. You don't want someone who's like, yeah, if it is, it was a cat. Like I've, I've heard stories, which I obviously won't <laughs> repeat, but I've heard stories of situations where it's like, it's obviously, it's, it's hyper transactional. Mm -hmm. Even when it's not just uh, a transactional, like it still can be really, really tricky to actually then utilize the celebrity and have the deal make sense. So mm -hmm. um, I actually get a little more fanboy sometimes when I get a hold of like a researcher <laughs> that I have been following for like a decade. Yeah. And then I get to be on a Zoom call or have a meeting with them. And I'm just like, uh. <laughs> <laughs> I get more tongue tied in that. Yeah environment because i'm like your work on fructose biosynthesis <laughs> in the liver is uh incredible like you know like i just like that's the stuff that actually kind of gets me a little more that's hilarious I love yeah it. just regulated. i love it uh what's next for olipop that you're most excited about so i uh just finished doing a lot of formulation the first half of this year i still do 100 percent of our formulation which is uh in addition to being uh a ceo and the, like the co-founder it's like a lot i'm just picturing you in like a room somewhere just you know mixing that's what's things, happening, things that's what's and... happening. yeah i mean i bought a new house recently i have a lab that's a dedicated room it's really nice to have your own kind of space in your house that you can and some good equipment and it's fun and i've got labs i can go to i've got good relationships where if i need to drop it in a lab i can but i spent yeah a lot of time doing a lot of formulation on uh, a handful of flavors that were very very requested from our customers mm -hmm. and so there's gonna be a lot of very happy people uh really in the next like month or two here yeah. and then even and then again uh early like q1 q2 of next year because we've we've basically like I, you know we have this Actually, by the way, if you're an Olipop fan, you're, if you have a flavor request, do let us know because we actually uh, keep every single one in a database. We've got like over 10,000 customer flavor requests and we have it all broken down by flavor, by ratio. So I know exactly what our customers are interested in. So that's coming um, in our intro. So we're actually in, we actually went from about 9,000 doors end of last year. So we're now in just north of 20,000 doors. Um, there's some there's some additional great accounts coming on that are going to increase uh avail accessibility for customers even more i'm really what happened i'm really happy about how the minions and banana cream launch went and there's some more stuff like that coming up so i think it's going to be you know it's going to be great i've never felt you know we're growing by 120 140 percent you know this year like uh and I've never actually felt better about the the internal construction, where all the different departments are at. Like, I feel very good about where we are and where we're going to be moving into this next year. What about the international focus? So for international, so Canada is obviously like a nearby target. A ton of requests coming out of it. The problem with Canada is obviously for half the country or so, you have to have like dual language packaging. So that adds some like supply chain complexity. But we're looking at Canada. The way I kind of think about uh international broadly is it's kind of similar to like pipeline innovation like well first of all we don't have a mandate so we'll see what we'll see see what happens if there's an astronomical opportunity depending on what route we go as a business this uh might not always be the case but for right now you know what we're thinking about is that it's probably important to prove out that the brand can be successful in a small handful of other countries mm -hmm. right so uh but america is also very large as discussed like this 40 billion dollar soda market to go and we have just south of two percent household penetration it's 
It's a good market. Is your home market? Yeah, there's a lot of work to do. I mean, traditional soda is 97% household penetration. Yeah. So we can spend the next two decades in just the United States and be just fine. That being said, I would expect at some point that we'll start poking around internationally. Uh, final question before we move in the win the day rocket round. Yeah. On your best day, what's an affirmation that you would write on a flashcard to show yourself on your worst day? <laughs> an affirmation. <laughs> oh my god, I am. Uh, I am not good at affirmations, man. It's not. It's not my strong uh, point. I probably need to make myself more. Affirm- I'm pretty hard on myself. Actually. When you, yeah, me, me too. The, yeah. uh, and I, I think a lot of sort of. Um, high performers and people who have that sort of go 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 mindset are on on your like really maybe something really generic like yeah. believe in yourself or yeah. some shit like that i mean cuz i do i do really think it's important that sorry to inter, interrupt but i i mm-hmm. do think it's important that like you do have to have respect for what you have accomplished and you do have to have like i i've matured enough as a business professional that i now have been in enough environments where I have like pretty good visibility on what specifically I bring to most situations that otherwise would not be present. And that's part of my unique uh, contribution. Right. Um, And so constantly keeping in touch with that is, I think, important. And that is something that would uh, keep redirecting me to that kind of observation, Mm -hmm. you know, which I think creates a combination of emotional stability and also knowing how I can be the most, you know, valuable to a given situation. Let's now move into the win the day rock around. Ten it. questions and some quick answers. You ready for this one? Yeah, I'll try to keep them quick. <laughs> <laughs> All good. Number one, what quote inspires you the most? So I'm not a huge quote guy, but uh, I actually love them, but most, you know, I don't retain them. One thing that my mentor actually said to me that I do keep close to my heart is that most things that are worth doing seemed impossible at the start. Mm. So I don't let the uh, scale and the the complexity of the challenge uh diffuse my observation that it's like still if it's worth doing it's worth doing i don't give a fuck if it seems impossible now basically (laughs) yeah Yeah. gee that's good that's powerful Uh, number two morning coffee or evening wine both (laughs) (laughs) i I probably need the coffee from the wine i drink green coffee actually i drink green coffee i'm trying to reduce my caffeine right now i probably put like 600 plus milligrams trying to get that down to like two to three hundred but uh and i'm also trying to or i also have reduced my wine but Mm. in my most perfect of days I would have both caffeine in the morning and wine at night. That sounds great. (laughs) (laughs) Number three, what's one bit of advice you'd give your 18-year-old self? So this one's, yeah, I struggled with this one a little bit. I think that, um, I think it's actually a combination of a handful of things we've already touched on. First, uh, it's a little bit of like, now that I understand a lot more about myself, like that brain scan thing I was talking about and other, like that feeling you have of being a weird fucking dude, like it's true. And it's okay. Like, it's basically, that's that's totally fine. So there's a little bit there around, like, self-knowledge and, like, self-acceptance. Um, let your freak flag fly a little bit. Mm-hmm. And then the other piece is, with that said, like, you also, with the life path you're going to choose, like, get the EMDR therapy sooner. And yeah. get the, you know, get really into, like, a heavy exercise regimen sooner. You know, the more... It's never too late to make it make uh, really positive changes to your life for sure. And if you're able to really ingrain those habits a bit younger, then all the better. Mm. Number four, what book do you gift the most? Uh, so it's actually not like a business performance book. The most common book I gift is actually something called Body Keeps the Score. Uh, it's a book uh, about trauma and trauma based therapies. Um, having gone through a bit knowing the NIH statistics on how many people walking around have a lot of trauma. It's, but as a country, we really sweep trauma under the rug. So the two things I think that get most of us is either unresolved trauma, either in ourselves or in our environment that, you know, creates like a, uh, kind of confusing outcomes. Uh, the other thing that can get you is people with personality disorders. Mm -hmm. So understand cluster B personality disorders, know how to identify them, know how to work with them, uh or not work with them but like deal with them and then understand trauma and if you can give out those things like you're in good shape mm. i know you sort of touched on this before but uh number five was there a vulnerability you once hid within that became your superpower yeah so i you know i do think it's so important to just like come if you can get to a place where you reduce your insecurity about the fact that you have insecurities mm. Um, just be like, yeah, these are my fucking insecurities. Here it goes. Here, this is what it is. Because the reality is that like everybody's running around with a bunch of insecurities. The reason why it's important is not only how it drives 
awareness of self and self-management. It's also all of a sudden, a lot of the shit that other people do or are going through or the responses you're getting makes a lot more sense when you incorporate that simple reality. Like, yeah, there's all these different insecurities. I think I used to get afraid. I used to be afraid of my insecurities. And correspondingly, I was afraid of some of the behavior I saw externally that was linked to, to insecurities. Mm. Having more awareness of and acceptance of my own allows me to have less fear of the external, mm. and that creates a lot of uh, resilience. Mm. Embrace rather than resist. You ha yeah, there's no, mm. yeah. The resistance is a false path yeah. uh, when it comes to your internal uh, space. Mm. Uh, number six, what's one thing you've learned about failure? Failure is a good one. I think uh, I think there's really two types of failure. I think there's uh, like strategic and mechanical failure, which is just like just it's fine. Move from it. Uh, learn sorry. Learn from it and move on. And then I think there's a failure of ethics or principles. That one hurts more and should hurt more. But with both of those things, I think it's actually very important to convert it into a uh, educational narrative for yourself and if desired others whenever you can. So that you can reduce the like <clears throat> self worth hit that's like unhealthy, uh, and flip it into being better for the future. And and then when everybody can kind of have more of that mentality, like on a team, you're a little less afraid of failure. You can learn from each other's failures, and I think you can actually use it to to convert it into strength versus having it dog you and being a dead end. Absolutely. Number seven. If you could sit on a park bench and have a conversation with someone alive or dead, who would it be? So, <clears throat> ideally, I'd like to sit on a park bench with uh, extraterrestrial intelligence that I could talk to. That would be the most interesting conversation. If I'm forced to choose a human, uh, <laughs> then, I mean, it's a little cliche-esque. A lot, lot, lot of images coming from space. I mean, we're not that far know, away from true. extraterrestrial. Just mathematically, sure. it's like very probable. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think Benjamin Franklin would actually be, first of all, we've got the same. I'm actually a Bennett, not a Benjamin. But, you know, but I what I love about, there's a handful of things like, he was obviously a highly, highly inventive soul or person. Uh, he was also really complex, uh, had ethics, but also struggled with them. Lots to talk about there. Mm. We're also in a pretty fucked up place as a country right now. <laughs> and everybody's always, you know, talking about the founding fathers. And like, wouldn't it kind of be cool to actually talk to one of them? Be like, okay, so here's all the stuff that's happened. Based on that, what would you actually suggest instead of you just being used as like a, you know, a straw man for all these yeah. people with, in bad faith, you know? Yeah. So I think it'd be like, you'd get a lot of birds with one stone. The source rather than the interpretation. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Number eight, what tool or resource best helps you run your life or your business? This, <laughs> this is, uh, <laughs> this is uh, kind of an annoying one, but honestly, getting an assistant has mm. been a massive uh, unlock for me. The, mm. All that brain stuff I've been talking to you about throughout this, like... I can provide a lot of value in ways that are unique to me in the way that my brain works. Uh, my assistant, she's amazing and she really compliments me and she helps to free up my bandwidth. So obviously it's not a piece of advice that's available for everybody. I'm in a very pri privileged position to have an assistant, but anything you can do um, that helps you use the parts of your brain that are more exceptional more often uh, and takes up less bandwidth with things that you don't care about, you don't like, and you're not very good at, I think is broadly speaking positive. Huge, huge. Yeah. Uh, number nine, share one thing on your bucket list. Okay, so for this one, this is something I do plan on doing. Uh, depending on what happens with Olipop, it'll probably happen post Oli Olipop, but I've always really wanted a Katana Wakazashi set made by a Japanese sword-like master. There's very few masters left in Japan who make those swords by hand. It requires them to stay for like three days with their apprentice fat folding the metal thousands and thousands of times. I would like to have one of those made when I've gotten to like an indisputable milestone in my life. And then, you know, I guess pass down as a family heirloom or whatever. So what a great family heirloom. <laughs> I know. I've always been fascinated by yeah. the Japanese focus on craft yeah. uh, and like their personal enlightenment they try to achieve through mastery of craft and um so that would be yeah i'd love to have someone's that. watching this has got like our family heirlooms a ceramic mug and it's like hey we're gonna have this epic japanese sword there's no, no comparison <laughs> final you, question number 10 what's one thing you do to win the day so there's a lot of like trite shit that i can talk it's like exercise is important sleep is important diet's important supplement regime is important all this kind of stress management is important i stretch for go to bed every night the thing that i think all of that ladders up to is the thing that's more important which is the those physical primers are there to put you in the right emotional and cognitive space right so i think what's super super key is always doing your best to retain that connection with yourself with i guess you call your your intuition a bit 
Um, but also from like a philosophical and a principles perspective to always like, why am I doing this? And then if that why were to express itself in an optimal way, how would it how would it play out? And then am I moving things in, in that direction or not? Mm. You focus on that all the time, like you'll you'll win that day. Yeah, so yeah. good, so good. Well, there are a bunch of ways to connect with Ollie Pop, and we'll link to these. In, uh, we'll link to all of these in the show notes. You can follow them on Instagram at Drink Ollie Pop, Facebook at Drink Ollie Pop, and for twenty percent off your next Ollie Pop order, use code Win Twenty. Again, all of that and more will be linked in the show notes. Ben, so refreshing. Thanks so much for coming on the show, James. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thanks for joining me on another episode of the Win the Day podcast. We want to hear your thoughts on what we covered today, so drop a comment on the YouTube version of this episode with your favorite takeaway, any questions you have, or what actions you'll be taking as a result of what was shared in this episode. And if you found value in the Win The Day podcast, leave a five-star rating on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. You'll find a link to both of those in the show notes. It'll only take you a few seconds and more ratings really helps other people discover the show so they can get the mindset upgrade they need and we can bring more winners into the Win The Day movement. That's all for this episode. Get out there and win the day. Until next time, onwards and upwards, always.